Happy Sabbath? Yes, yes, it's true. I've been on the road again. On the road again? No, I won't sing. I won't sing. Two Sabbaths ago, I had the joy and the pleasure of baptizing a young friend of mine in British Columbia on Vancouver Island in the little fishing hamlet of Sydney. Some of you have been to Victoria, BC, which is the southernmost city there on Vancouver Island. Well, just above Victoria is Sydney, and that is where Chris and I used to live and pastor. And uh, little kids like the ones that you saw just now, they grow up to be bigger kids. And it's a real privilege when they decide that they believe what their parents have said and that they decide personally to follow Jesus and to, de- you know, to show that by getting baptized. It's a great day for parents and uncles and aunties and grandparents and I just have this feeling that there are many here today who would love to show through baptism what is already going on in your life. So if you've never had a pastor make a call at the beginning of his sermon, you can say that now you have. Because I'm going to invite you to contact me if you feel the need to tell the rest of the universe about your love for Jesus. That's what baptism's all about. My friend Matthew, while we were in the water together, I reminded the congregation that before you get baptized, you're engaged, right? It's kind of like a wedding. And when you get baptized, this is the ritual that we go through to say, I'm hitched. And in this case, I'm, I'm, I'm together with Jesus. So if that's a statement that you would like to make publicly to God and these witnesses, then don't wait. Don't put that off. He hung on a cross publicly for you. So now it's time for you to do this for him. It's easy. Easier than you think. Now I can also tell you that it is my firm conviction that you then have the opportunity to decide if you want to be part of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'll talk to you about both things. I no longer put them together. I see them as two separate decisions because I believe in the Holy Spirit. And I believe that he will lead and guide people as he sees fit and that we as a church can recognize that in those who ask for baptism and in those who ask to be a part of this interesting, very tumultuous movement of destiny and prophecy that we love to call the Adventist Church. Because let me tell you, when you go back, like I did this last week, two weeks ago, and you see people who have lived their lives on for another three, four years since you saw them last, and you find out their testimony, and you know how rocky it has been, and you realize that you are not the only one with crazy stuff happening in your life. That's why I feel impressed this morning, just to let us all know that it is time, it is time to be sure It is time to commit. It is time to say in front of God and all these witnesses, I'm with Jesus. Last weekend, that was two weekends ago, last weekend I had the opportunity to speak at a camp meeting. And this was a joy because it's a camp meeting that I've been to many times in British Columbia and I worked with the early teens at that time and so I was able to address them on Sabbath and that was a lot of fun. 
But then the, the Monday following that, I was able to go to a wedding of another dear friend of mine who is marrying the love of his life, and I mean the love of his life since he was 10. All right? So <laughs> you, it, it was a great story. Actually, she was the one. She was the one who decided at 10 years old that she was going to marry him. So uh, through thick and thin, she held out, and uh, James and Jenica got hitched uh, to much fanfare in a beautiful church in, in Vancouver, Canada, and uh, we, had a grand, we had a grand time watching that. And I tell you what, again, as parents and as church members, it is wonderful to see when those that, that, that have been raised in the knowledge of God gravitate to each other because they know that each other will be a help to them as they continue to follow God. So I'm going to say, uh, if James and Jenica, if you're watching this, God bless you and thank you for uh, loving each other like you do and showing that. Um, one quick thing. James wrote out his vows but the boy was so emotional. <laughs> it was amazing. He was so emotional, he could hardly get these vows out for the love of his life. But he did it. And uh, his, his now wife is very proud that he did because he does not like to speak in public. It's good to be home. It's good to be in Santa Clarita, California. I was proud when people asked where I lived to say, I live in Santa Clarita, California. Where's that, they would say. So I would say, do you know where Magic Mountain is? <laughs> oh, yeah, I've seen Magic Mountain. I said, well, you're in my town when you see Magic Mountain. <laughs> are there any other things that are a claim to fame for us? Please tell me, because I'd love to, I'd love to hear. I've entitled our time together this morning, uh, good intentions, well, God's intentions, actually, so we're going to get to good intentions. So just bow your heads with me, if you would. Father in heaven, you know that you want us to hear you, see you, feel you in our lives, and I just ask that as we look at some scripture here today, that we will indeed get a deeper sense of who you are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good intentions. <laughs> that's, that's what I would like to start with. Good intentions are often what we hear about when somebody does something that wasn't exactly what they wanted to do or what the people that they did it to wanted to have happen. We usually say, oh, but he had good intentions. We try to save face. We try to, to uh, save the situation by saying, oh, he had, he had good intentions. Even though it didn't do what he wanted it to do, he had good intentions. And so we, we understand that these are our motives. These are the things we've thought about. These are the things that, that we show what we have thought about in action. They are our intentions. Sometimes uh, things happen and we realize that people actually did have bad intentions. Okay? When my father got cancer, I learned the meaning of the English word malignant. It has the smaller part of the beginning of that word, to, to malign. It's a verb. It means to, to tear down, to, to infest and, and rip apart and, and to maybe make rotten from the inside. And so when the doctor says you have cancer and it is malignant, it is telling you the intentions of the cancer. We don't want to hear that we have cancer that is malignant just as much as we don't like individuals in our orbit that are malignant. 
in their intentions. So there are good intentions, and then there are bad intentions. Uh, we have a, a sign up. I think I put it in my office now. It says, live, laugh, love. You've seen these things. You know, Hobby Lobby has lots of them. Uh, they, they look a little funny and kitschy, but you know what? They're good intentions. They're good intentions to live, to laugh, to love. They, if you take that as your mantra in life, as your, as your intention, I believe that you'll have a better life. It's okay to have these kinds of intentions and to tell yourself, to speak to yourself about your intentions because you will then have better intentions in life and because you have planned, you will have goals and you will achieve those goals. How about this? Um, we, we have another phrase, best intentions. Again, this phrase, best intentions, uh, kind of gives us the idea that we have, in, we have evaluated the intentions, either our own or, or, or someone else's. We've evaluated those intentions, and we've decided that there are some intentions that are better than others. There's been a judgment call about the intentions, maybe, maybe a measurement of intentions. So you have good intentions, you have best intentions, and today we look at God's intentions. What are God's intentions towards this planet? What does he intend to do? or to be with this planet. We've heard from prophets, even today, we've heard from a prophet, we've, we've heard from these people who are God's mouthpieces. Today we have heard about the intentions of God. And in the Isaiah text that we have read today, he intends for Jerusalem the mount of, on top of which Jerusalem is, is perched, he intends for that mountain to be the highest. Understand that this is very poetic, very, very uh, directive language that is helping us to understand that Jerusalem is, is a city. Now, name for me the opposite of Jerusalem. Real quick, test question. If you have Jerusalem in the Bible, what would be the nemesis of Jerusalem? Babylon, okay? Is Babylon uh, uh, situated on, on any sort of mountainside? Picturesque. Yes and no. Some of you are really into prophecy, I know, and you know that there are hills, there are hills that a certain other city named Rome is built on. So you have in the Bible mountains, and these mountains represent kingdoms, and the, on top of these kingdoms are cities, and cities always represent people. And so you have God saying in Isaiah to, through Isaiah that his mountain and his people will ultimately be on top. We have texts from some of these prophets like Jeremiah. One that you know very well, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. I have good intentions, God says. I have good plans for you. Plans for your good. I, I have good intentions towards you. So as we ask the question about our God today, what are his intentions towards us? In the midst of the the pain that we are experiencing in this congregation, the pain of loss, the pain of separation. What are God's intentions towards us? I believe that he has good intentions towards humanity, towards this planet. I believe he comes in peace. Now you've heard me say before, so I'll say again. Peace is that idea of welding us back together with God. Okay? So you see, we, we make the peace sign, but understand that really we should understand that it's the coming together. It's almost like the shaking of hands. It's the coming together 
that Jesus came to do to weld us back together with our Heavenly Father. He comes in peace. I believe He came to spread peace like a glue to glue us back together with our Father. He comes to bring goodness and prosperity. I believe that too. Three things I think that God intends. Uh, He intends that we know Him. Now, some of you know that I have a, a, a great interest in the natural world. I like to learn all kinds of things. I watch nature programs. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in what people say about these things. Uh, I'm not an evolutionist. I'm a creationist. Um, I actually listen to evolutionists because they have very, very interesting things to say, but I choose to see the natural wonders of our world as the outgrowth, pun intended, of a creator who has good intentions towards me. He has foliated the the world. He's put leaves on trees that give us oxygen. And we expel carbon dioxide, which they like to take in. He intends that we know him. And the first book, I believe, that he uses in order to educate us about him is nature. I love the song, This Is My Father's World. It's becoming a, 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 a big thing with me to sit and contemplate the fact that this is my father's world. Jesus is the king of this world again since he rose from the dead. And if that is true, my friends, then we need to be enjoying this world, don't you think? I think that, that we have spent way too long looking in, into the distant future, maybe not as distant for some of us, And thinking, oh, I'll enjoy it when Jesus makes the world new again. And we tend to look at all the bad, look at all the decay. Well, I'm here to tell you this morning that if I gave you a present and you didn't even bother to open it and you just looked at how good my tape job was on the outside of the present... I'd be offended. Imagine how God feels when he has gifted us with an incredible world to live in that is so beautiful. I mean, I'm ready to sing, this land is your land, this land is my land, up and down California, because I drove it all, and Oregon, and Washington, and into British Columbia. This land is your land, this land is... This is a beautiful country. We live in a beautiful part of this country. When was the last time that you said, thank you, God, for all the incredible beauty that you have given into my life to give me joy and happiness and and, and just a, a wonderful... Because there are literally billions of people on planet Earth who live in slums, who live in diabolical situations where the world has been made into a trash heap. You, you've seen the movies. They even called one Slumdog. Slumdog Millionaire. Because people live like that. Okay? So when you can, when you can get away from that, this this cesspool that we have made certain parts of our world and you can get back into the situation where God can be seen in the pristine world that has even been damaged by earthquakes and fire. Yeah, we drove through some smoke in in Oregon. There was fire by the side of the road that they were trying to put out. Even with that, though, there is beauty and 
love. And I believe that God wants us to know him and he wants us to know him through nature, through enjoying that nature. And I believe that if we see that God has saved us and is interested in us now, and that our eternal life has already begun because we have accepted him, then we can sing with a new understanding that song, This is my Father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget. Let's not forget. This is his world. He wants us to know him, and the biggest way that he wants us to know him is through the beautiful gift of an incredible place to live. Let's not take that for granted, because the second thing that we often take for granted that is so much around us and in our homes, I can almost guarantee that you've got 10 of these at home, is the Bible. We have them in the pews, and we don't even mind if people take them home because we've got more. We'll just put another one in the pew because we want people to open the Bible and see the Bible. Now we've got technology, so we put the, we put technology, we put the Bible up on the screen so that you can read. As my Greek teacher would say, you can take it in through the eye gate. By being here on Sabbath morning, you take things in through the eyes, you take things in through the ears, we we clean the church so that it smells nice, sometimes we put a candle out there so that you can smell that this situation is good and clean and ready for you. So all of that imprints, and what does it imprint? It imprints the words of God in your heart and in your soul. He wants us to know him, my friends. And, you know, you could say that the phrase is true. He is basically saying to us, to know me is to love me. That's what he's saying to us through everything that he has given us, both outside in nature and also through scripture. Secondly, I believe that God intends that we know ourselves. You, you, you're probably saying, huh, I, I think I know myself. But how many of you past the age of 60 would raise your hand today and say, I am not sure after 60 years of life that I completely know myself? There you go. See, at least one person that has taken the time. Thank you. That was very, very candid of you to to agree. <laughs> I'm, 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 not yet, I'm not yet 60, but I'm going to say that <laughs> it's, it's very interesting to be alive even more than 30 years and to think that you might know yourself by the time you are 30 is a hope that many of us had. And then when we got to 30, we found out that there was so much more to understand about me. He wants us to know Get this, the self that he created. Now, the the phrase that gets used these days is, be your best self. Raise your hand if you've heard this. Be your best self. It's the inference that you could potentially be several different people. And that you could choose to act differently and be a different self. Some people say, choose your best life. Now, uh, the, 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 the pronoun that is used in that sentence is about you. It's about me. As if, as if, what I choose is going to be the best. Well, I would like to put forward the notion this morning that God intends, part of his intentions are that we would come to know the self that he created us to be. So when I ask you the question again, uh, do you know, maybe I should say, do you know that self? That's the one that I'm 
continuing to try to understand because that's the one that believes that our creator is the one who has created our best self. And the one that he has created, he wishes for us to be recreated. He wishes for us to be recreated and for us to be born again. You heard that? You heard about being born again? Well, this is where it fits in. God intends for us to be born again, to be recreated so that we come to an understanding of the self that he created us to be and that shows off his DNA. It's what it means to be family, right? You show your DNA. Thirdly and lastly, he intends that we know sharing. Jesus came, I believe, to show us the sharing life. God intends us to experience the freedom, the freedom of the sharing life. He blesses us with every new day that he gives us. And he sends, as the Bible says, he sends the sun and the rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. He sends the sun and the rain, my friends, on all humanity. He sends the the power to, to drive the economy that we have in this world that we mistakenly claim that we have produced, he sends the power to drive that economy. Without the sharing of his power with us, our world would stop. It's nice to be a seventh-day person, isn't it? It's nice to sit here and say, I believe in the creator God, but just understand what you're saying. You're saying that you believe that he runs, he powers, he powers everything, and he shares it with us. As he lifted off on his way to stand beside his father, I believe that Jesus ordained his believers, his his followers, to be witnesses of the unselfish, of the sharing life. So God wants us to know him. He wants us to know ourselves. And he wants us to know the sharing life. Finally, I bring you to our text today, John 3, 16 and 17. And and just, just say it with me again because you're supposed to know this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yes, you learned it back in the day when the King James was popular with everybody. I'm glad we read it in a more modern translation because some of those words we don't, I mean, we don't say only begotten. Hi, uh, I'm Mike, and this is my only begotten son. Just don't use those words anymore. This was the only thing that God had to give, and therefore he gave everything. And by the way, it is a very inclusive statement. He loves who? Everyone. He loves the entire world. We, we should know this. Because you see, he says this to Nicodemus because Nicodemus didn't know. And Jesus was shocked. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This was the goal that every good self-respecting Jewish person had was everlasting life with the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. This was what they had been aiming at. And yet, when Jesus asked the teacher of Israel, he did not know. They had been following a very elaborate system which I'm going to call a religion. 
So be careful, please, when you say that I am religious. Or even be more careful when you say I am not religious. Because they followed a very elaborate religious system that was constructed to give the haves the satisfaction of judging the have-nots. Here's how I know. We're Jews. You are Gentiles. We're Adventists. You are are non-Adventists. Do you see why? I don't even like using that word anymore. That was the haves judging the have-nots because their religious system said, you have permission to judge. I believe that it was a complete an utter misconception, misappropriation. That's the taking of and using for unnatural purposes. It was a misjudgment of God's intentions of when he called Abram and Sarai and made them into a nation. That Jesus came to his own people And his own people did not even recognize him, nor want him, and in fact plotted to kill him, is evidence of idolatry. They had begun to worship the system instead of the God who invented the system. So be careful. Nicodemus represents those who should have known. He was the teacher of Israel. He was dumbfounded by Jesus' declaration as as I hope you are dumbfounded, as I am dumbfounded when, when my judgmental nature comes up and I want to say I'm good and they're not, or anytime I want to think like that, I should be dumbfounded by Jesus' statement that he came for everybody. That's that's painful to hear because we want to say to ourselves, I'm not them. Jesus, as 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 one writer has said, didn't have any thems. I believe we are dumbfounded because in many respects in in Nicodemus' place, we, we find ourselves being upended by what Jesus has said and his intentions towards all humanity. The question we have, though, is do we still see humanity, uh, our neighbors, through eyes trained by these old measurements? Or do we see humanity through the eyes of God's intentions? John 3, 17. God intends, hear it folks, hear it here, now let it sink into your soul. John 17 says that God intends to save the whole world. That's his intention. So in asking the question this morning, I'm now answering it with John 3.17. God intends to save the whole world. Believe it. Live it. And bask in his glory. Because it is his glory that we are interested in. Not our own. Because he is the one who has said that he's coming back very soon and that he wants his whole family to be ready. Amen.